All right, we're going to get started. Hey, we're going to give it another minute. People are still wandering in, and uh, then we'll get started. Come in and grab a seat, and we'll get started in due course. Thanks very much. Uh, well, uh, thank you all for coming. I know the eclipse was uh, probably a distraction uh, to getting here, but uh, thank you all. I'm surprised as many folks actually showed up, so this is great. Um, so I didn't have any slides prepared. I was just going to give sort of a, I don't know, just like a bit of a background on me, how I sort of started things. So I'd say my, uh, my path, you know, started when I was probably around 13. And um, I got my first computer. It was an Apple II Plus, and back then that was kind of like pretty amazing tech, I would say. Um, started writing software, got into it pretty heavy, I would say. Spent quite a bit of my, my free time writing different kinds of programs, games and stuff. Um, taught myself uh, machine language, which was sort of like wow something for me because it was just so amazing. And what that sort of led me to was... Um, had some friends who worked at the high school uh, library, and I don't know, I was sitting around watching what they were doing, and as part of like the regular process, every, every Friday they would go through all the different books that were returned, sort of go through you know, a written list of who took out what book, and then have to go through and like, say, okay, it was returned, and for all the ones that weren't returned, they had to create like, a whole bunch of uh, pages by hand, and post them outside the library saying, hey, you, you know, you have an overdue book, and, you know, with the person's name and the book and all that. 
And I just kind of looked at that process and I was like, oh, man, you know, I could write a program for this. And um, that sort of started me off on this journey, you know, of, of an entrepreneurship in terms of, you know, doing custom software development for different companies. And so I wrote this really cool database program uh, in machine language for my uh, Apple II Plus, and they bought an Apple II Plus, and it was all good. Uh, five years later, by the way, after graduating high school, they were still using that program. Uh, so that was kind of nice to see. Um, so then, um, you know, in high school, I actually did a few other consulting jobs for a couple of different companies, um, writing inventory um, and invoicing software uh, for them. Um, some of them were like, one of them was a, a carpet and tile uh, store. They, you know, um, basically inventorying that. And so, again, it was sort of really pushing me towards this, you know, idea of creating my own company that I would just, you know, make money from by doing custom software. Um, and certainly throughout high school, this love of computers just really instilled in me, you know, what I wanted to do. I mean, there was absolutely no doubt in my mind. And I, I know that's hard for a lot of people. You know, a lot of people think, you know, what am I going to do when I grow up and what is it, you know, that I want to achieve? I sort of had, you know, this very fortunate knowledge early on in my life. Um, and so Waterloo, to me, was the only place to go. Uh, so <laughs> I had uh, aspirations, obviously, of getting in here. Um, and thankfully, I did. I got into the uh, uh, computer science with, back then, it was electrical engineering electives. So it was kind of a nice little branch. I loved the, the idea of hardware. Uh, and that's where it came from, that machine learning, uh, machine language that I had done in my Apple days. Um, and so when I started here at the university, I found, um, you know, the co-op was just such a great opportunity for me to go and experience other companies um, and to see where I wanted to sort of like really focus my attention. And um, did a number of great terms. One of them was with the uh, stock exchange. That was fantastic. You know, I think, you know, I thank Waterloo for giving me that opportunity to work in different environments. But to go on the trading floor, this was back when the Toronto Stock Exchange had a trading floor that you could be on. I uh, got to work with some of the, uh, some of the, the, the uh, stockbrokers um, and write software for them. That was super cool. Then I ended up doing a term, my last term, because uh, they shut that group down in the, in the TSE. My manager moved to IBM and he said, come on over to IBM. This is awesome stuff we're doing. Went over to IBM, which was awesome. I must say it was like groundbreaking for me because it gave me the opportunity to do some stuff in my co-op term, which was kind of cool, but it also taught me I did not want to work for a big company. That was like, for me, because everyone I sort of knew always wanted to work for really big companies. That wasn't my thing. So after I got out of university, I went to work for a very small company. Um, it was about 10 people. And um, learned a lot, really smart guys and girls, um, and sort of really gave me that I want to work in the embedded space. I really loved working on you know, software that interfaced with the hardware directly and did some cool stuff with that hardware. And a couple of years into that company, I decided, OK, you know, it's time to move on. Um, they weren't really going anywhere. So did my first startup, um, worked with uh, some really great people. Um, we built a product. It was a, um, a virtual private networking gateway. Um, we spent about a year and a half on it. We got acquired by a company. Then we got, a year later, got acquired again by Intel. So now I was working for a big company again. Um, stayed there a few years, but that, that, that big company atmosphere was killing me. Um, and so decided to, I think it was time, you know, the, to move on again. And so was talking to a number of people, um, ended up uh, with one of the venture capitalists that I had known, and we ended up doing another startup. Uh, that startup was horribly unsuccessful, unfortunately. It was a great idea, loved the idea. It was basically plotting people's pictures on maps. And so you could virtually go to different places because uh, you could see all the people who had posted pictures there. Unfortunately, Google Map came out and just like killed the whole concept. Uh, so that uh, lesson learned, if you're going to develop a technology, make sure uh, it's somewhere that Google isn't, um, or, or an affiliate of Google, <laughs> or Apple, um, or Amazon. Um, so very hard going. Um, so we spent, uh, spent a couple of years in that, and then um, uh, went back and started looking around for, for some other ideas. 
uh, ended up working um, with uh, someone from my first startup, uh, Stuart Lombard. Him and I were, were um, hanging out with, uh, again, some VCs. He was actually a VC at the time. And he wanted to do something new. And that's where the idea of uh, Ecobee uh, started. So that was about 17 years ago now. Um, so Stuart and I basically um, got together. His notion was around this smart thermostat. Um, I built basically all the technology around it um, that we started the company with. Um, and it was an interesting go. And I think you know, one thing that was a bit different this time around uh, compared to some of the other startups was we really went after VC funding. And I think there's a big difference between doing a startup you know, just on your own, on the side, you know, kind of self-funded. Maybe you've got some parents or friends of family, whatnot, who you know, sort of give you some cash to, to get started versus going out and seeking uh, VC investors. And so with Ecobee, we went out specifically to find VC investments um, to raise at least several million dollars to start the company. Um, and we felt you know, with about two to three million dollars, um, you, know, you could basically create a company and build your first hardware product, um, which wasn't a bad guess, actually, as it turned out. Um, and so, obviously, you need a bunch of capital if you're going to build hardware. Um, or maybe not, obviously. But what was interesting uh, with Ecobee is the reactions. Um, and so when you talk to VCs, they're an interesting bunch. Um, most of them are, are, are um, very good business analysts. They understand um, you know, technology to a certain degree. Um, but sometimes their, their vision of a future is a bit clouded. Um, and it's usually clouded by their, their existing beliefs. And so we really had to push hard. And we had a lot of people look at us and said, you're crazy. I mean, who would want, really, a Wi-Fi connected thermostat? Like, that was just, you know, just something you wouldn't even think of putting in your home. Um, and this idea, you know, of a smart thermostat, it didn't exist before Ecobee. And so, you know, we really had to fight hard. And what was great was we did get, eventually, about three different investors. Uh, one of them was uh, this VC firm that Stuart used to work with um, to, fund our, to fund our little project. Um, then we brought on our, our hardware engineer as a co-founder, uh, John Metzler. And that's where, really, you know, we went for the first year, basically heads down. Um, and I think... You know, a common theme for me, at least, in my career and trying to start startups is you got to go all in. Um, if you're not like 110% dedicated to the mission, I don't know if you can be successful. I certainly found it wouldn't be successful for me, um, especially when you look at how much runway you have. And so generally, the biggest problem with any kind of startup is you say to yourself, if this doesn't get going within some amount of time, I have to go and get a job that will actually pay for you know, food on my table. Um, and so you know, with Ecobee, we had a certain runway. And so we had that runway from VC investment. But if we didn't show massive progress by the end of that first year, you know, it was going to be very hard to raise further funds. And so as you can imagine, everyone on board, the t company at that point when we first you know, basically got off the ground was six people. And <clears throat> as with anything, six people, not a lot. So you can imagine, you know, when you're in a startup mode, you do lots of jobs. Um, it's not like you do one job. You do like six different jobs uh, because you don't have the employees. And so, you know, from the very start, my job, basically get that thermostat software up and running so that it could be put into homes and we can actually start trying it out and testing it. Um, and that was, you know, a huge part of my initial start uh, to the company. Unfortunately, I don't write code anymore. But you know, as we've progressed over the years, you know, the scope and the scale uh, of the company has grown. And, and I'll tell you, like, prior to Ecobee, I've never actually built a product you know, that you could see in people's homes or on a shelf in a store. And uh, you know, something that you know, I'll never forget was the first time I went into a Home Depot and saw you know, my product sitting on one of their shelves. Uh, very cool moment, uh, and I think, you know, as an entrepreneur, you know, you look at something like that and you say, wow, I actually, like, I did something people actually can recognize, because um, usually in the tech space, you know, you work on pieces and parts of things that your friends and family would have no clue what you're actually showing them. Um, 
And so when we, when we did that initial uh, product, we ended up you know, having to look now a year into the future and two years into the future, what are we going to do next? And I think that's one thing that's really interesting about you know, sort of my journey over the past 17 years with Ecobee is this like, long-term roadmap planning. You know, what are we going to do next? What are we going to do next? Um, and so this constant need to innovate is always there. And so you kind of think like, hey, when you create a company and you do a startup, that innovation you know, got you going. But is there further innovation? And there has to be. And I think that's one thing that's, that's critical as you start to like, mature as a company is to keep that innovation going. Um, so I don't know. I think that was probably about 15 minutes worth. Uh, OK. Any questions? We can move on to questions. Um, actually, before I take them from the audience, can I ask you a question? Because this is the question that comes up yeah. that I hear from students a lot. So since the time you, know, you started Ecobee and things, the environment has now changed dramatically in the sense that you know, VC funding seems to only be chasing AI. And at the same time, all the AI companies are saying, OK, we're going to get rid of all the software engineering jobs. right? That's all going to be automated. And, and at the same time, we'll actually get rid of all the lawyers and doctors and things like that. So what is your perspective on this sort of new environment? Like, is it still possible to uh, follow the path that you followed with uh, Ecobee? I, I'd say there's always room for innovation. I'm not convinced AI is going to innovate. I think AI can hold a great role for doing a lot of different tasks. Some of them might be software development. Um, and I'm sure you've all played with you know, chat GTP or other little tools. And you say, oh, I've got a computer assignment due this week. <sighs> OK, uh, can you write me a program that does blah, 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 blah? And then the thing spits out a nice little program. And it's super cool. That's not innovating. I think that's just solving a problem. Like, hey, what's you know, pi times 17, blah, blah. You, know, you can give it formulas, and you can ask it to do things, which is great. What's going to be the next iPhone? I don't know. You can ask ChatGTP. I don't think it's going to tell you the answer. And, and so I think what I think is interesting is you know, there's roles humans are going to play, I think, until we're completely uh, taken over by AI. Um, but there's definitely roles you have to play. And part of that is figuring out you know, what is it that annoys you? you know, and this is what started Ecobee. And a lot of, I, I would say probably 95% of startups start the same way. The people starting up the company said, something annoys me. There's something wrong with the way you know, this world works today. And I'm going to fix it. And you know, in our case, it was the thermostats at the time were horrible pieces of garbage that you know, just ran your HVAC, whether you were home or away or whatever. You went on vacation. Your house was still heating to the same temperature it was when you were there. Like, why? You know, it's like a great question because we save you know, over 26% of homes' uh, energy every year by doing just smart things that really weren't a leap. They were just like an added innovation. And I think that's where you know, innovation today is. You know, ignoring all the AI out there, there are still things that people say, hey, I wish I could fix something. And that's where I think you know, humans have to do it. Hi, thanks so much for the really great talk. Uh, so I think I'm going to start with a hard question. So let's say for the building a very successful startups, the ingredients. How do you rank the ingredients if, let's say, the first ingredient is the idea, then dedication, then the founding team, prior experience, connections, and the VC funding? How, how do you rank these six? Or if I missed something here, let me know. I, I think you've got a really good list. I'd say, you know, certainly, if you don't have a team, you don't have anything. So like, I, I want to put people ahead of everything. The idea is super important. The idea can morph. So you may have an initial idea that you know, after six months, you decide to change direction because you weren't getting any traction with the initial idea. That happens. Um, VC funding is important, but it's not the be all and end all. Um, and you know, if you can sustain at least doing some of the work without funding, great. Uh, certainly, you get more reward at the end, the less it's funded um, or the less it's VC backed. But 
certainly the idea has to be something that is going to you know, be loved by people, even though it can take quite a while for that love to actually show. Hello. Hi. Hi, Mark. Thank you for your time. Um, can you tell me how you got from zero to one in the sense, okay, so you've built this prototype. How did you find product market fit? How did you iterate on this prototype? And so you built a consumer product. How did you put this in front of people and get feedback at scale initially? How did you get from zero to one? Yeah. Yeah. So I would say it's, it's uh, <laughs> you know, it's a tough slog. Um, when we first got our first you know, product in hand, I think we had built about 10 units, and then we built more. But you know, let's say the first 500 units. That was critical. We started giving them out um, mainly to the channel that we were focused on, which was the HVAC channel. So these are, uh, the HVAC channel is basically people who come out and, and fix your heating and cooling systems when there's a problem. So that was our initial way to roll out a product. Um, there was no Home Depot, Canadian Tire, Lowe's, you know, nobody was going to talk to us. Um, you know, small little company from uh, Toronto, there was just like, there's absolutely no way. Honeywell was the, you know, be all and end all for thermostats in those stores, and there was no way we were going to get shelf space next to Honeywell. Um, so really we focused on that initial channel, and I think that was important, obviously. Um, and so, you know, early, early days, even before really we had a product, we were talking to that channel. We knew that channel was going to have to be our friend. And so we went out. I did a lot of tours with a lot of different HVAC professionals, sort of going into customers' homes, seeing what the HVAC people actually do, seeing how they look at the equipment, seeing how they fix the equipment, because I had no background at all in thermostats or HVAC, absolutely none, other than like just being a programmer, saying, I think I can fix that problem with a program. Um, and so really, you know, understanding that space is critical. If you, can't, uh, if you don't know that space, you're going to have a really hard time trying to build a product that people want. Um, and certainly that first, I would say 12 months after we finished our first product and, and launched it uh, in January of 2009, we were right on top of all of the utility companies. So again, I was on like a mad dash to go and visit all the utility companies we could find, a bunch in Ontario because it was close, but we also went out into the States as well because we knew utilities were going to be another major way or major source for us to promote the product and get it out into customers' homes. Um, and that was in large part due to the fact that utilities were just starting with what was called demand response programs, um, and that was a way that they could basically shut off your HVAC uh, while well, they were having you know, issues trying to keep up with energy load. And so we knew pretty early on. We spent a lot of time doing research with utilities. So I'd say we spent like probably five years researching different ideas with utilities on what to build. Um, and I think that gave us a lot of momentum. The work was all thrown away, basically. But the, the main part of that was the, the knowledge and the sharing and, and just building all the contacts within that space, the utility space, gave us great momentum 10 years later. Um, and now we're you know, number two, basically, next to Nest in terms of overall uh, sales uh, in North America. And you know, a lot of those sales uh, are attributed to the utility channel. Uh, HVAC channel is the other, or, or another big one, and retail. So I think building those relationships was huge. This, this is what I'm saying where, where you have a problem in your life. And, you know, global warming hasn't been, isn't a new idea from the last five years, right? Global warming has been around since, like, 30 years now, um, or at least the concept of it being more publicly made, available. And, and so, you know, Stuart would often uh, go to his uh, cottage up north and wonder, you know, why is my house still heating and cooling, especially in the summertime, cooling? Uh, so he would manually, you know, have to, like, remember to turn it off. And then if he left, he'd be up to the cottage going, oh, you know, I forgot to turn off the air conditioning in my house. Like, that was stupid. And he was very much driven, uh, I would say, by, by global warming and trying to reduce his, his footprint, uh, carbon footprint. And, you know, that's what bothered him. He had no idea about HVAC either. 
Completely, zero. But it was, this is bothering me, it's a real world problem. Why isn't this stuff smarter? And so that's what was basically the, the founding reason. And, and I'd say a lot of startups are the same. There's something that bothered that founder, and they built a product. I mean, you watch Dragon's Den, I'm sure everyone's seen it. You take a look at half of the things that they come up with, and it's to fill a void that you know, no one else has filled. And you know, why did they do it? Because it was personal to them, and they wanted to take on a challenge. I think that personal you know, part is really important because it does drive you know, that dedication, you know, especially when you have that passion. I think you know, every time I've done a startup, I've been like, totally engrossed in it. It's my passion. I want to see this thing through. I want to see it succeed. And I think you, know, you have to. So we, we have a few questions that were submitted in advance. And one of them you just touched on. You said earlier, don't pick an area where Google is going to come in and move in. Yeah. And I was going to ask about, I guess the question here is, how does Ecobee differentiate itself from the variety of alternatives in its industry category? But the word nest pops to mind. So, yeah. um, you know, how, how do you work around? I mean, as an entrepreneur, that's kind of an issue when something appears in the same space, especially, you know, with the word Google next to it. So, yeah. you know, how do you handle something like that? Um, well, you, uh, you, go through, you go through different stages. I would say it was quite a kick in the gut when uh, Google bought Nest. Um, you know, that was hard to take. We were, we were also sort of dating Google at the time. Um, but I think, you know, like any, you know, hardship in life, you uh, dust yourself off. You say, you know what? This isn't the end of the world. We're going to make this happen. And you just have to push through. And I think you know, one thing about you know, when Nest started, obviously having Tony Fidel and you know, $100 million basically invested from Google compared to our $2 million uh, was like night and day. right? Like driving down uh, our offices in downtown Toronto. So we'd, you, know, you come in in the morning, and I'm driving along the Gardener, and I'm like looking at these huge signs from Nest right, talking about their thermostat. And we'd be like, Damn, wish we could afford a sign. Uh, there's no way in hell we could afford a sign. Um, and that just gives you like, sort of this idea of like the big behemoth. You know, Basically, we started the category, but I'll tell you this much. The one thing that, that Nest did for Ecobee was they showed us what a really great product could look like. Um, and with the amount of money that they invested in, in their Nest thermostat and the user interface and the design, it was really beautiful. And so I think that really gave us uh, a bit of a kick in the head. Um, iPhone had just launched. So looking at the iPhone and saying, you know what, we're going to make our thermostat <clears throat> sort of look like Apple. Apple was you know, renowned, obviously, for the user interface and the designs. And so we modeled a lot of that, both because of Nest and what they had done, but also with the technology at the time. It was just all kind of like brand new, and it just gave you an idea of where you could go. So that gave us motivation to say, you know what, we're going to make our product stand out, and, and that's what we ended up doing. Actually, uh, my, uh, thank you for your talk. My question was about Nest, actually. Uh, so you started before Nest, and uh, you were recently acquired by, I think, a U.S. company. Yeah. And uh, I want to take you back some history. Um, some time ago, um, like, um, there was a startup from Waterloo called Rapid Mind by Professor Michael McCool in the CS department and his student. Um, there was another company started later called Peakstream. That was uh, bought by Google. And RapidMind ended up being bought by another company, Intel. And Professor McCool was kind of uh, wistful that Google didn't pick him in his dating. <laughs> and so we we're back again here where a Silicon Valley company gets bought by Google. And a Canadian company gets bought by another company, not by Google. And uh, I guess you know there's always like a Canada tax, and you can't shake it off. It's like even though we might be the first, we might be better technically, but there's always like a tax that you know we don't have the right connections. We don't have the, I mean, yeah, I guess the funding. You mentioned Nest has lots of money. So I guess we kind of, and we are kind of like a little bit annoyed at that, but we, I guess we persevere regardless of this tax. It'll always be there, I suppose. Um, nothing we can do about it, perhaps. Nothing. Thanks. 
I guess, yeah. I guess we need a question. A is the question. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm not sure of the question so much as is the sympathy. Um, I think it is, it is harder. It is harder in Canada. There's no doubt. Um, there's no doubt because we don't have access to the amount of funds that they do in the States. Uh, you know, it's plain and simple, at least for, for a lot of the different startups I've seen. Um, it's just very hard to generate that sort of energy here in Canada with the number of VCs that we have. Um, and so, you know, typically if you're, if you're going to go for VC funding, you know, it in some ways is helpful to get Canadian funding uh, if you can especially get some help from the government, whether it's, uh, you know, provincial or federal. Uh, sometimes, depending on the startup, you can get some assistance there. Um, but I would say it's, it's been tough. I'm hoping actually COVID helped. Uh, and COVID may have helped because this notion of, you know, working anywhere. So a lot of the problems with some of the U.S. firms was they wanted you in their state or they wanted you in their city and they wanted to be close to you. Um, and so that, that kind of made it difficult. A lot of them wanted us to like move our head office to wherever they were located. Um, I think now the world is more acceptable to working anywhere. Um, and so potentially COVID might have helped that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, how come we don't have the connections? I mean, like, uh, other companies, other countries, you know, they get bought by Google, and, like, then obviously, then Google, like, end of life sort of products. But, I mean, just like, uh, why can't, you know, Google buy a Canadian company, you know, like, once in a while? It's like, uh, why don't we have the connections, if you though we don't have the funding? Why, what's missing there? Don't know. Don't know. Don't know the mind of Google very well. I'll make that a harder question. So, what's your advice if you're doing a startup? Should you move to the Bay Area right away, or should you uh, try to build it up in Toronto? <laughs> um, I'd say depending on your funding, <laughs> Bay Area is very expensive, and so uh, you know you're probably looking at like two x uh, for what it would cost to do it in Toronto. So I think um, <clears throat> if you can afford it, it's not a horrible idea, but it is expensive. And the competition for jobs is also huge there. Um, and so finding really great talent is hard. So you think the talent is more available here than it's... Um... I'd say it's more available. Well, like people are more willing to move here, I'd say. Um, sorry, move meaning like move to your startup uh, okay. here. Um, yeah. I'd say Bay Area, you know, there's already a huge footprint with all the massive companies, uh, and, and, it's, and it's just hard to pull people out. So if you create opportunity here, you can attract the same kind of talent, do you think? Or? I think we have awesome talent. Like, I, I, you know, I'm one for supporting uh, certainly Canadian talent. Um, I think, you know, we have awesome engineers coming out of universities like Waterloo and Toronto, um, and, and I think, you know, there's definitely no reason why Companies can't be competitive here, and it does take it does take financing. So I think that's the biggest challenge. So as long as you can secure some sort of funding, <clears throat> I think anybody can be successful. Do we have another question? Yeah. Uh, can Can you right here? Can is it yeah. You're a little closer there? Uh, hi, I my question is regarding your. Uh, sales strategy or marketing strategy like for example when you have already established like founded the company and you have uh, the idea is there the prototype is there now the hardest part like to get your first paid customer so uh, and you don't have enough budget for marketing and sales do advertisement all that so how you suggest for a uh, company which is just uh, newly founded yep. and they want to acquire their first paid customer yeah, as you say, um, you know, we didn't have the cash, so marketing dollars was very tight. We basically relied on word of mouth, uh, so that was our strategy. And you know, maybe not sound like the the most secure strategy, um, but it's certainly a strategy. Um, and and by word of mouth, it's you know obviously online. So most of our sales initially were through online uh, services. Uh, you know, beyond the HVAC channel. So the HVAC channel was one, was one method, online was the other. Um, and really trying, you know, 
our intention or our hypothesis was, if you build a really amazing product, you know, your friends will tell two friends and they'll two tell, <laughs> tell two friends and so on. And so, you know, going after customers who had bought the product, you know, getting their reviews, looking at where the problems were with the product, getting that, those things fixed or addressed uh, very quickly, you know, all of that to build that customer confidence that you've, you know, sold them an amazing product, that you're supporting that product. Um, you know, I think it, it, it goes beyond just marketing. And so when you build that relationship with that customer and they feel safe and comfortable uh, and they start, you know, telling their friends, that's how we sort of really started in those first early years before we could afford real marketing campaigns. Um, and I think, you know, depending on the product, but, like, the problem with the thermostat is it's controlling something that's critical in your house. So, uh, you know, uh, there has to be trust. You know, people don't just, like, bring something into their house that, that could possibly fail and cause damage to their house. So it really did take a long time uh, to get that trust. And, and um, certainly with, with the marketing funds that we had, it was, it was a tough go. Um, but I would say, you know, going after those sales channels I, I mentioned and really getting our salespeople, even though we only had a few at the time, focused on, you know, getting deals made, right? Buy 100, buy 100 thermostats and we'll give you 10 free. Like, whatever kind of deals you had to make, you had to make. Um, and I'll tell you, like, uh, it's kind of like silly now, but you know, I have a picture of that first year, and we got a skid of thermostats. It was probably about you know four or five feet by five feet, five feet square, um, and that was tremendous. Like we'd never, I, you know, I'd never seen that many devices that we had built yet, um, and so you know, now we ship over a million a year, um, and you know, the, that path was really about always making sure product had great reviews. You know, how can you get you know, your CSTAT, CSTAT scores higher? How can you get those customer reviews to 4.3, 4.4? The mobile app you know, reviews had to be in the fours. Like, everything is around the customer getting their satisfaction. Hi. Uh, you mentioned how, you know, when you were young and growing up, you like you know you built a lot of things, and definitely that is a, cu a culture that we see a lot nowadays through hackathons and stuff like that. But to you, what's the difference between something that's either like a side project or something you work on for fun, and then a startup? Um, <clears throat> I, for me, um, it was this notion of maybe I can make a go of actually making a living out of this thing. Um, and so I think if you're just doing something for fun and playing, it's, it's good. Don't get me wrong. Did a lot of it. Uh, did a lot of things I knew I would never sell. But I think that startup mentality comes in when you're saying, I'm going to go all in on this idea and make a real go out of it. And making a go of it means, you know, I basically took no salary for a while when we started Ecobee. Like there was things like I sacrificed, and I think there has to be sacrifice in general. Um, there's some sort of sacrifice. It's your time, it's your money, it's something. Um, but that's, I think, the difference with a startup. Like you're willing to sacrifice to make that go of it. I had another question. So I think, as you said, Starting a startup is a risk, taking a risk, because you can't have a very good full-time job in a big company like Apple or Amazon. But I think because you also had one unsuccessful startup experience, I think it's also very important to know when it's time to actually stop, because you are just wasting time and resources and VC funding. And so yeah. what, what is the criterion you use to basically say, okay, I love this project, it's like my baby, but I should let it go and save myself. So I think that's something I want to know. Yeah, yeah. And you know, and I think back, as I was talking earlier, but you know, I think back to a previous startup that like basically Google Maps basically killed. Um, 
and Ecobee. And I could have said the same thing with Nest. When Nest came out with their thermostat, we could have just said, you know what, we're going to close the doors. We're never going to make a go of this thing. Uh, we can't compete. They're too big, they're too massive, and, and they have too much money. But I think the main difference was with, with that uh, uh, photo sharing sort of idea, I couldn't see the business case. Like, I couldn't derive revenue from that business model because Google was giving it away for free. So that became a killer for that. I can't make money off of something somebody else is giving away for free. Nest was still charging for their thermostats. So there was still a play there. And I think the play was, one, around security. So our concept of security was, was like ingrained in the initial you know, part of the product. And that, to me, was a differentiator. And when I say security, I mean several different layers of security. But one is, you know, do you want to have Google know everything about you on everything, right? Maybe, maybe not. Certainly in those early days, there was a lot of like concern, right? It knows about all my email, it knows about where I am, GPS, it knows blah, 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 blah. Um, and so this kind of gave you know, additional options for people. And we were, we were really playing hard on uh, Apple to, to help us be a differentiator. So we were the very first uh, company, actually, that you know, Apple came out to reach, uh, reached out to me and wanted us to integrate with, with HomeKit. HomeKit hadn't really started yet. It was, uh, it was an idea that was brewing in Apple. And we built you know, HomeKit, essentially, with Apple. And we were the first product to, to uh, launch that. Um, and that was, again, you know, just like the start of a really important relationship with Apple. And you know, certainly over the years, it's been like one of those main differentiators between like Nest which is all Google, and, and Ecobee, which has always been, I'd say, really focused on Apple. We do support you know, um, Google interfaces as well, but um, that, was really, that was really sort of an important aspect uh, for us to focus on and differentiate. So when we had that, you know, how can we be better than that big competitor like Honeywell and Nest, we could come up with reasons. And so I think that's what kept us going and, and kept us alive. Follow-up to the follow-up. Thank you. Um, so you're able to be make a viable concern of your company uh, as a consumer company, whereas, you, as you said, your previous company was not able to be viable as a consumer company. But I guess it's also partly because it's hardware, and so you can charge money for it. But I'm thinking, um, I mean, yes, you, I mean, you, you can be like make profit, profit as a consumer company, but why not say add to it? By going enterprise, like why? I mean, like I mean, uh, could it hurt you your focus or what? Like uh, you know, you could like make like a lot of like say inroads and sales and enterprise markets uh, automation for there. Why not also go there? Yeah, I would say you know, and it's not startups. Uh, every company has this problem. It has this problem because you know where do you spend your time and resources? Every company, no matter how big it is, is limited. Um, and so when we looked at our space and we said, you know, do we want to go after, you know, hotels, for instance? You know, it's a good, you know, maybe a good space. There's thousands of thermostats, you know, one in every hotel room. Um, but, you know, when you start to, you know, take off the layers, right, like peel the onion and you're like, hmm, what are some of the problems if we go into that space? And then you start, like, you know, basically writing it all down. Here is the pros and cons for this strategy, pros and cons for that strategy. Commercial space had a lot of cons. Uh, had a lot of cons because there's a lot of different types of equipment, a lot of different kind of protocols and interfaces. There's all kinds of different like systems that they interface with over Modbus or, or uh, different protocols. And then they have like these large back-end systems to control it all. So long story short, you know, after like a pretty thorough analysis, and I say we've like it comes up every two years, uh, so we keep looking at it. But you know, it was a decision of if we can make our inroads and make it successful in retail. You know, retail is where we need to be successful to keep the company growing. And if we ever do, you know, more commercial focus, that's great. But we had to be a retail first uh, company to be successful. Yeah. I'm going to take a question off my list, um, which is sort of related to that. Um, it's to asking about gas sensors, um, but also there's generally in Internet of Things, right? So 
Uh, well, more variety of gas sensors. Is this part of your future plans? Gas sensors, other Internet of Things sensors, and then what's the challenge in developing these sort of Internet of Things yeah. devices? Right? Yeah. Um, you know, I'd say uh, we've developed a number of sensors. Uh, so we, okay, toot my own horn. Uh, so we were the first company that came up with that uh, wireless uh, remote sensor. So basically, it's a little sensor, battery powered. You put it in different rooms in your house. It measures temperature and occupancy. Uh, we built a little door sensor. So when you open a door, it detects the doors open or closed. Um, so we have like built these sensors. There's more sensors I think we'd like to do. I think part of the challenge with, with sensors and peripheral devices is there's a cost to them, obviously, in terms of the development. And there's a cost to them in terms of like maintenance and keeping the software up to date and having it. So there's a bit of a tax you pay uh, every time you develop something. Um, and it could be just a feature. Features, you know, hopefully you can automate them enough in terms of like testing so they don't cost you constantly. But with hardware specifically products, there's a tax um, that you inevitably have to pay. And whether it's you know, updates to the firmware on that thing or different design parts, uh, you know, uh, I don't know how many people have seen this, but you know, over the last few years, because of COVID, you know, supply chain was like an, an enormous challenge for Ecobee, as well as probably every other company in the world. Um, and that supply chain really brought forward the tax that you pay as a company. Because when you can't get a CPU anymore, and you got to change the design to a CPU you can get, that takes engineers, it takes a whole lot of testing, it takes manufacturing, it takes industrial design. And all of a sudden, you know, a product you were happily selling now costs you another $2 million of investment to keep happily selling it. And so those things happen. And so you know, it's a bit of a challenge. Yes, you can build lots of little things, no problem. The building part is kind of easy in some regards. It's that tax, maintenance tax, that you end up paying for the rest of your life. That's hard. Okay, we have Ryan. Uh, yeah. Um, in your university life, like especially here at Waterloo, there's it's you're you're in one or two situations when you're in the co-op program. You're on school, and like you know you're you've got uh, academic pressures, or you're on co-op, in which most places are like you're working at nine to five, and then you can experience tiredness after. Which, in which time did you feel like you were most innovative in university? The time where you had a lot of academic pressure or the time where you were already working such a long job and then had to like, you know, do your routine outside of that? Uh, <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, I would say I was a bit of a machine uh, in that I didn't sleep much um, and I just worked constantly. So whether I was doing schoolwork or I was writing software for other companies and selling those products. Um, didn't seem to matter. Or whether I was doing my co-op job during the day and then doing work at night. Um, I don't know. It was just my personality. I just loved, uh, I just loved being busy. Um, so yeah. I'd say I, I basically kept going throughout both my school career when I was you know, in class and um, uh, when I was doing my co-ops. I didn't party much. I guess I was a bit of a, a geek. Um, well, still am, uh, unfortunately. But yeah, it's okay. So the message is: don't party too much. Yeah, um, don't party too much is right. Yeah. So I think most of the people here are math students or CS students or something like that. And you said some scary words earlier, mm. like supply chain and manufacturing and things like that. Yeah. So if you're, you know, if you're coming from a computer science kind of mindset, you think of building a product and that's a piece of code and you just ship the piece of code and away you go. Like how do you make the trend, you know, if you want to do a startup more in a hardware space or more in a, you know, something that touches the physical world, how do you make that transit, like, how do you make the transition to doing that? Um, <clears throat> you know, you got to find good people. So I would say, you know, We've had some amazing people, uh, and they've been with the company for 14 plus years. Um, and, and some of those people you know, have done roles, um, for instance, with our supply chain manufacturing. And they really understood the space. You know, they came from companies who were building products for years, and they came to Ecobee, and they had a lot of knowledge, and they understood the, play, uh, the, the market. They understood 
how to go out and, and you know, source uh, parts from all over the world, how to do contract manufacturing outside, you know, like in Malaysia or China or wherever, um, and had those relationships. So I would say, you know, as a founder, that wasn't my role. I was never going to be as good as somebody who's been doing it for 20 years. And so find the right people to take on those jobs. Um, but I think even, you know, as important is common sense. And it, and it sounds funny because you say, like, common sense. Like, why wouldn't you? Common sense. Um, it's incredibly important because, you know, every day, and it doesn't matter, actually, whether you're an entrepreneur or not, every day you have to make decisions, right? And those decisions can be based on passion, emotion, common sense. You have data to back it up. And I think one thing that we've always been, like, super, super critical of, and it's really important, is, you know, you make those decisions based on common sense, based on data, you know, so you, you, you don't just make a decision because you felt like it was the right one. You make a decision because you've got the data to back it up, and it made sense, right? Um, and I think that's where, you know, a lot of times where we've made decisions over the years, you know, go into commercial space or not. When you boil down that data and you look at how much revenue there was potential, what kind of margin could we get on those products? You know, if our margin is getting killed to 10% margin, it's not a great space to be in. You want to be in 30 plus percent margin on hardware products. Uh, so there's like industry standards that you want to learn about too. But, you know, I'd say that focus of like, when I go to make a decision, how do I make it? Make sure you get that data to make it. Yeah, I, I find personally, if you come from a software space and you go into hardware space, you don't really understand that that's going to be shipped to somebody's somebody. And when they turn it on, it has to work. You can't oh. count. You can't count on updating it. Oh God! Yeah, you know, uh, I'll tell you this much: when you build hardware, uh, you have sleep, sleepless nights. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I was like petrified uh, that when we were rolling out a software update, I was blowing up all the thermostats that were out there. Um, I still have them, actually, uh, because when you've got like, you know, we've got, you know, millions of thermostats in the field today, and, and especially with thermostat, again, because it's a bit of a critical system, but you can imagine, like, even Apple, right, like, the last thing you want to do is push an update to the phone that bricks the phone, right? Can you imagine bricking billions of phones? Um, you know, so certainly early days, I was like petrified that we'd brick, you know, a thousand devices because uh, that would end the company. So there's lots of like, oh my God, this is like, all these things could happen and it's life ending for the company. Um, and yeah. It's like sending out a space probe. You can't go get it and bring yeah, it back. Right? No. Okay, we can do one more question um, or I can take a question off the list. Uh, oh, all right. Well, that's all right. So uh, as the company becomes bigger and bigger, as yours, you have to give up some equity to VCs, external investors, and others. Yep. Um, I have seen some of the entrepreneurs who were very successful, but at the end, when they wanted to basically exit, they didn't have any equity left because of the kind of terms that was included in their VCs. They wanted multiples that wasn't there, so basically... So what is the best way, what is the best strategy to make sure that while you are growing your business, yeah. you also make sure that you look after yourself, that you are not basically working for a big company without you knowing it, and that big company can be a VC basically taking use advantage of you. So what's the best strategy to avoid these kinds of situation? Uh, well, there's many. Um, I would say one that I've seen a lot of companies fail with is not being smart with your money. So an obvious example, but it's not obvious, is when you do get a, run, a round of funding secured, a lot of companies are like, woohoo, you know, we just got $10 million secured, you know, we're like in great shape, we're just going to party now. And they go and they blow that money within two years. Either they blow it on massive ad campaigns or they blow it on just like going on a hiring binge and hiring like 10 times too many employees that they could actually effectively manage within a certain period of time. Um, there's lots of different ways you can blow that money. But blowing that money is devastating. Because why? Yes, you've given up you know, some percentage of your equity 
you've also now used up that cash and you've got to go back and get more cash. The more times you go back and get cash, like as you can imagine, if you're struggling, VCs know that. They smell blood. So either they're not going to be interested in you know, giving you more money or they're going to want a bigger slice of your pie. And so you know, at the end of the day, what's really important is you're really smart with your money. You are really, you know, you build as fast as you can. So the quicker you can get a product into the market, the quicker you can get like that new software, you know, out in customers' hands, getting those reviews back, seeing at least some sales. I mean, obviously sales grow over time, but if you can start to show sales, if you start to show evidence to VCs why when you val did your valuation of your company, and you can get outside sources doing valuations, but at the end of the day, you have to have something measurable to show them, here's the progression we've made. So from like, you know, day X when we started to today, here's the progression. It's, it's usually like one of those like massive sort of, uh, you know, exponential curves that every company shows. Um, every VC says, sees the same graph. What's important though is showing here's where we are on the graph, here's where we were, and this is why the graph is going to make sense and how we're going to get to those you know, exponential sales in two years. The more you can do of that with the cash that you have in hand, the better off your, you know, your equity will be if and when you're, you, know, you sell. And you know, the point of a startup, I would say if, you're, if your motivation, here's a lesson learned, if your motivation for a startup is to sell your startup and make a lot of money, don't start the company. Um, I think you're going to be horribly disappointed. Because it's the wrong motivation to start a company. You should be looking to start a company that you think, one, you're super passionate about and you think you can actually be successful in building. If you're not successful, it's unlikely you're going to get bought. Now, I say that, OK, there's a big thing right now with AI companies. And it doesn't matter if you're, you know, have a clue of what you're doing or not, you're probably going to get bought. Great. You know, there's always times in this world where there's like crazy stuff going on in the market. But I'm saying, if you're building a product, you really have to believe in it. And you have to say to yourself, you know what? In five years, yeah, it's not so much my intention to get bought. My intention is to be super successful. I mean, if I'm successful either way, I ain't been making a lot of money. And this is going to be awesome, whether you get bought or not. Um, so anyways, have that mindset, please. Don't just worry about the end game. Think about how great your product's going to be in five years and how you're going to be taking over you know. Nests or Googles or whoever's space in the industry, and you're going to be, you know, number one. So chase success, don't chase money. Is the yeah is the message? Okay, I think that's so. We have a reception next door, so uh, we're going to thank Mark again. Thank you so much for coming, and you'll be uh, hanging around for the next half an hour or so next door. Um, so if yep. you want to chat with Mark, then that's great. Uh, any. Uh, Photo. Yeah. <laughs> come on down. Come on down. If you. Okay. So can we just have a few people come in this way? <laughs> right. <laughs> Two people. That's okay. okay. Uh, or not. Uh, come on, come on. Don't be shy. We should give you priority on the food if you. Yeah. All right. Or you can look forward. All right. Um, Okay, so is this... Uh, oh, yes, your, your pink... Oh, my pink thing. Yeah, your pink thing. Okay, great. Bye.